Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Renate McNe and my guest today is Daryl Bailey. Hello, Daryl. Hello. I would like to show you his books. Um, they both came out at Non-Duality Press. One is called Essence Revisited and the second Dismantling the Fantasy. And I think that's where I would like to start, Daryl. Mm -hmm. What does it mean, dismantling the fantasy? <laughs> Which fantasy? <laughs> Whose fantasy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, basically, I'm pointing out to people that our general experience of life, our common experience of life, does not support the usual views that we have of existence. So we usually look at existence in terms of form. We usually look at... Uh, at existence in terms of things that we can understand. We often have the sense, or we generally have the sense, that we are somehow uh, a body that is moving through life, that within this body there is some kind of nebulous form called consciousness moving this body through life, and life is generally a collection of other forms. And I'm simply pointing out to everyone that their co common experience, their everyday experience, does not support that in any way whatsoever. And in fact, it points to something very radically different. So, are you saying a human being, as we think we are, doesn't exist? I'm saying that there's this happening, the happening of this moment, and I'm ultimately pointing out that there's absolutely no way of explaining what this is. So all of these storylines about human beings uh, living in a world are ultimately a fantasy. I'm not saying that this happening does not exist. I'm saying that our general impression, our apparent impression of what it is, that's a fantasy. It's a kind of mirage. Um, this happening um, has no ultimate form. Um, it has no, there's no way to ultimately say what it actually is. And... So, so, so when you say this happening does not have ultimate form. Yes. What does that mean? If we look at our experience, yeah. all of us will eventually come to say that everything changes. Yes. So an infant, an apparent infant, has no sense of what existence is about. But as we apparently live a life, we all will come to some point where we eventually say that everything in life changes. If that's true, that must mean that existence ultimately has no form. So it would be very much as though if we were lying on a hillside watching a cloud and we saw the cloud form itself as uh, a person, it seemed to look like a person, and then a few moments later it seems to look like a horse, yeah. and a few moments later it looks like a house, in that situation with the cloud we always know it's not those apparent forms. The cloud is an event that has no form. We don't say that a cloud looks like a soldier or looks like a house we all know that a cloud has no actual form. However, in our daily lives, we have the impression or we believe that existence has form. And yet, if I ask anyone on the street, do you have the sense that everything is changing? And they will tell me, yes, that's true. So that must mean that ultimately it's exactly the same situation as the cloud appearing to have form, but these are simply passing appearances and that the actual event of existence has no form. It's a totally inexplicable, um, unformed event. And basically, in the same way that the cloud is presenting itself, this event of the moment is presenting itself. We actually are expressions of that event. So where is this event happening? Is it in a kind of a vacuum? No. Where are you? You are sit. I mean, I see you sitting here. Where are you? Where am I? Where is the... Where is the form and, and, and I mean it must be a container where all this flow is happening. No, that's an assumption. Why would we say there must be a container for this? There's just this. There's just this happening. This is all that's ever evident. This is all that ever presents itself. This happening that we call this moment. There's just this happening. It seems to have form, but these forms are a kind of mirage. So, and it's very much like a mirage. Mm -hmm. With a mirage, you appear, water seems to be appearing in a mirage. If we see it for the first time, we believe that water is there. So, however, if we investigate the mirage, we realize there is no water there. 
And yet, even though we know there's no water there, we still see water. So it's the same in this situation. The happening of this moment appears to have form. It's just this happening. There seems to be a form. But we know that these forms are ultimately changing. These bodies are growing older uh, as I speak. It's not that they will stay looking like this for the next 35 years and then all of a sudden decompose. Unfortunately, when I look <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we all have that experience. Yes. And, and once again, it's an obvious experience. Yeah. Yeah. So we all have the sense that whatever th form we see, whatever apparent thing that we see, this is changing in some way. So ultimately it has no form, yet we see form. So with all of us, we have some fundamental sense that this event is moving and shifting and changing. All the apparent forms are changing, even though we actually see form. So it's very much like the mirage. We see water, but we know that there's no water there. Ultimately, in our experience of life, we see form, but we know that actually that form is some kind of apparent movement, that it ultimately has no form. Yeah, but despite the movement, I can touch you. I can hug you. That's right. I can have feelings with, with, you know, hugging you and touching my children. I mean, there are so many sensations ar arising. Yes. Are you saying that it's all... I'm saying that that's happening. Yeah. There's just no way to describe what it is. All of that is obviously happening. This, what we call hugging, yeah. uh, is occurring. Yeah. But I'm saying that happening is happening. There's just no way of saying what it is. So in this, I'm pointing to the fact that all of us have the sense that when we came out of the womb, uh, we had no storyline for existence. However, there seems to be this process where we're begin, we, we get taught uh, specific labels and we eventually string them together as a storyline. So f we all have the sense that from a very early age, people start pointing to things like this and they say, can you say nose? They point to something like this and they say, can you say ear? And so on. This, go this seems to go on for a number of years. Basically, we're being taught to bark a certain sound when something is pointed to. An apparent form is being pointed to and we're trained to bark a certain sound. And if we do that good, we say, well done. <laughs> exactly. We go to school and we get gold yeah. stars and yes. we, we get an A. Yes. So we're encouraged to do this. We're encouraged to put our focus on these labels and on the storylines that will eventually be composed from these labels. But if we examine what's actually going on, basically what's happening is we're given a meaningless sound and that is attached to a form that doesn't actually exist. So in an English-speaking country, we get these sounds that we call English. So we get words like body, consciousness, awareness. If we were in another country, we would get other sounds, radically different sounds. The sounds themselves have no meaning. If we all agreed, we could use sounds like blicks and flute and wazzle. So we can sit and we can have a discussion about a body, consciousness, awareness. But if instead we had agreed that it would be called blicks and flute and wazzle, in one instance, we would seem to be understanding existence. Oh yes, it's a body and it's a consciousness and it's awareness. But actually, it's the same situation as talking about blicks and flute and wazzle. It has no meaning, it's just gibberish. Yeah, but there are certain words I can hear that give me meaning. It could be a poem. There are certain words which makes me fall in love. There's an event that's yeah. taking place. Yes. It expresses so itself. Words can have, what I, I want to, to say is words can have no meaning, but they also can have meaning. And maybe it has to do with, with something energetically, something which is able to touch our hearts. Well, within this story-making process, this apparent story-making process, the, the sound itself has no actual meaning. It only mm -hmm. gains a kind of meaning when it's attached to an apparent form. That form can be what we call an object or it can be something that we call an emotion. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the word emotion has no actual meaning. Once it becomes attached to this apparent form, this apparent happening, 
then it gains some kind of meaning. And that can have a quality that we would call feeling. Mm. So the sound itself has no actual meaning. It gains an apparent meaning from the actual happening. So really, the happening is expressing itself, but still the sound actually has no meaning. Somewhere in that apparent process, we get the impression that the, the sound is actually telling us what it is. There is the happening, the apparent happening. It's expressing itself, but there is actually no way of saying what it is. If I, you and I are sitting here and we're having a discussion, for us that seems to be what's happening here. If I bring a child that's one year old and I place the child, or one month old, and I place the child on the table and I say to the child, please tell me what's happening here. For the child, there's absolutely no question. There are no things. And this is, when I went to see Robert Adams, um, just stop me if I'm proudly on here too long. No, yeah. <laughs> um, when I went to see Robert Adams, mm -hmm. uh, at that time he wasn't teaching in any kind of complex way. He was making a very simple statement. He, he would sit and he would say, there is no body, there is no mind, there is only love. That's all he would say. Yeah. And then he might invite us to do the I am meditation. So we would say, I am, I am, I am. And then we would sit and do absolutely nothing. So when I first went to his gathering, he had said we could ask questions. And this was my first time with an apparent uh, enlightened being. So he, he made this statement, you are not the body, you are not the mind, there is only love. And I thought, well, that's a curious statement to make. I don't really know what he's talking about, so let's explore that. And I asked him, Robert, he said, yes. I said, could we perhaps put this in a different way? He said, yes. I said, let's say a baby is being born into the world. He said, yes. I said, for all the adults watching, there is a baby being born into the world. And he said, yes. And then I said, but for the baby, that's not happening. And he said, no. And I said, because for the baby, it's simply a totally swirling, buzzing, vibrating event that has no explanation whatsoever. And he said, yes. And then I said, but in this apparent happening, there seems to be a process of learning this labeling. And at some point, that apparent baby will be 15 years old and sitting on a park bench wondering, where did I come from? Why am I here? What's this all about? Am I okay? Is there something wrong with me? Um, and he said, yes. And I said, but actually, there is no 15-year-old sitting on a park bench. There is no world. He said, no. And I said, because it's the same basic mysterious event that it always was. It hasn't stopped being a totally inexplicable happening. And he said, yes, you are not the body, you are not the mind. And I said, you are not the body, you are not the mind, because those are totally fantastic notions about what is going on here. There is only a totally inexplicable happening doing what it does. End of story. And he said, yes. So in that moment, I realized, okay, well, all he's meaning by love mm -hmm. is a kind of openness within the event, because the ultimate sense of love is a kind of objective openness. Normally we say it's an objective openness to the event of life, but there's nothing separate from the event of life that could open to it. There is only the event of life, and somehow there's a, it seems like there's an openness in the event once this realization occurs. There's simply an openness in the event. Because there's a realization that there's no option to how it moves or how it expresses itself. It's just this doing what it does. So, Daryl, how did you come to this realization? I know you, you were a young boy when you already started observing yes. that everything was just a movement or yes. a flow. Um, when I was about the age of seven, yeah. um, I grew up initially on a farm till about the age of seven. And I remember at that age, I would sometimes be standing on the edge of my grandfather's grain fields on a sunny day, and it just seemed like the heat of the day would envelop me, and there would just be the sense that this was one big event, and that the event was just constantly animated. You know, what we call the grain moving in the wind was simply the dance of life. Now, when you're seven, that's not a big thing. When you're 14 and you're usually walking around thinking that you're something separate from the rest of existence, mm -hmm. and you're still having these moments when all the thought would fall away, 
there would just be this big event, that seemed to provoke an exploration of, you know, what is this? Why is it there's this one moment, there's the sense that everything is okay, it's just one big mysterious event, and the next moment there is this sense of feeling some, being somebody separate and that everything is form. And so that seemed to provoke a journey through life, an apparent life. Now I don't believe this fantasy. And there seemed to be apparent moments that other facts about this event seemed to present themselves. So when I was in my 20s and people were saying, you now have to choose your career, mm -hmm. I couldn't comprehend how do you choose a career if you don't create your body, you don't create your brain, you don't create your interests, you don't create your needs, you don't create your concerns, you don't create your abilities or your inabilities. So already with 20, you were completely clear what existence is or how? No, I was still confused. I, I was yeah. expressed as a, as a state of confusion because I would ask my friends, like, you keep saying how, like, to choose my career, but how would I do that? I wasn't actually clear that my sense of it was the fact. And so there was just all this confusion because there, there was this expression of the great event. It was making yeah. itself obvious. Well, how did that impact you? Um, I mean, I, with I, 20, the, the ego is on its height. Yes, it was very confusing. Yeah. It was very confusing. I tried, I apparently tried to get into some career. I would get into relationships. I was trying to do what everybody else was doing. I was try apparently doing. I was trying to fit in. And I tried for another 10 years until at around the age of 30, I realized I can't fit in where everyone so else you, is. So you had different teachers you were visiting? Or what, um, did, what did you do well, to, I was, to bring clarity in your mind? Um, did you meditate? I think you started meditating with 14. Yes. Yeah. When I was 14, yeah. um, I had an experience where I was walking down the street. It was a crowded street. And at that time, I was highly self-conscious. Like I, I felt I was inadequate compared to everyone else. Right. Um, and I was always concerned about how I was being judged by others. And one day when I was walking down the street, I looked down and I saw my shoelace was undone. So just automatically I bent down to do up my shoelace. I was totally connected with doing up the shoelace. And when I stood up, all of a sudden I realized that I was in a crowded street and for the first time I wasn't feeling inadequate. Somehow being directly in contact with sensation the activity of doing up the shoelace, I was out of the world of thought. So immediately I went home to my family's residence. And we had a family room in the basement and once you closed the door, no natural light could get in. So I went into that room, I turned the lights off, I lay down on the floor and I began to notice the physical event of the moment. And very shortly after I began doing that, um, these incredibly open states express themselves. And once again, they would be there for a, an apparent period of time, and then they would leave, and it would be back to the feeling of being a person separate from everything else. Upon experiencing that, or upon that arising, this open um, expression, exp uh, making itself obvious, it was a done deal, like I just wanted that. That seemed more real than everything else, anything else that I'd ever experienced. So I began exploring through various books. Um, you know, I felt intuitively it had something to do with meditation, so I began exploring meditation techniques. Yeah. And it was all to come to the happening of the moment. So there was the counting of the breath, there were certain relaxation techniques, there were basic awareness uh, practices, there were certain concentration practices that I would take from Hindu teachings, Sufi teachings, Buddhist teachings, Christian teachings. And at the time, it was the late 60s, so California had a lot of interesting psychological techniques that they were using. So for 17 years, I explored all of these various practices. I would spend from one to three hours a day um, exploring the happening of the moment. Eventually, it just felt like that there was something I was missing so I began searching for a teacher that would be compatible with my approach because I was only interested in the event of the moment. 
So yeah. why, why did you think something was missing? Because what, what, what was the feeling or what, what didn't you not experience or well, what was it about? It seemed as though there was a freedom in these mm -hmm. moments when there was just this big event making itself obvious, yeah. but there was always this flopping back to the sense of being a separate self. Right. And in that there was a feeling that somehow I was missing something, that mm -hmm. somehow there was an invisible wall I wasn't getting through, and it wasn't for a, a number of years before I realized that the flopping back is also the expression of the divine. Mm -hmm. So that open wondrous, um, undivided happening, the, the, the grand sense that we are the great ocean, that's just one of the expressions of the unformed. Everything is the expression of the unformed. And eventually it became obvious that even the most gut-wrenching, confusing experience where we think that we're doing something wrong, that is also the divine expression simply expressing itself. Mm -hmm. There is never anything other than this unformed, indefinable event doing what it does, and there's no way of saying what it is or what it's doing. It's just happening. So when you realized that, did you feel? What did you feel? Was that an incredible relief or freedom? No, is, is that freedom? No, immediately I thought I was crazy. <laughs> so I got concerned. I was uh -huh. really. I people had warned me never to question free will, and. Um, you know, at, at this moment, it seemed to arise in a situation where I was lying in bed reading a book by Ramesh Balsakar. The general message of the book was that no one uh, has ever had an experience of directing their life. And there was one particular line in the book, I can't remember what line it was. I got, the eyes got halfway through the line, then they left the page, and the mind said, you have never done anything. And from that moment on, I could not find an example anywhere in my experience of me actually directing my life. Mm -hmm. So my immediate, or the immediate response that arose to that was, uh-oh, I've gone, I've done, done something wrong, like this can't be right. Like everybody said, never question free will, and now I can't find any, any example at all of me ever doing anything. Um, but... There was also, it was also obvious that I wasn't in any kind of strange state. It was the simple happening of the moment. And it was a simple assessment of what my actual experience had been and now is. And so initially I was trying to find a contradiction to this sense of life. So I would question all my friends and ask them very pointedly, you know, can you give me an experience of actually moving your life? And no matter what they presented, they couldn't give me an actual um, experience where it was shown that they provoked the movement of their life. So what's happened over the apparent years since is that I now have the opportunity to say to people, have a look at what your experience actually is. And you may realize that this is a totally indefinable event, simply doing what it does. We've never been anything other than the expression of this event. It's not a person, it's not a consciousness, it's not an awareness. These are meaningless sounds attached to forms that don't actually exist. There is simply the unformed event of this moment. And that is expressed very clearly in all of these spiritual traditions. So, ultimately the Bible says God is spirit and it is in God that we live and move and have our being. And Christ basically says that if you um, believe in this teaching, you will find that the spirit moves in your body. So we are an event. The breath's coming and going, the heart's beating, moods come and go, sounds come and go, everything moves and shifts on its own. We are this great spirit. Everything is this great spirit. Or you could call it the unformed ocean of existence, or you could call it the river of life, or you could call it the Tao, which basically means the flow or the current. Um, you could go to quantum physics and just call it process. Quantum physics says there are no things, there is only process, and that the apparent things in this process uh, are related, but they have no causal relationship. They are related in some fashion, but it is not 
a uh, it's not a local relationship, meaning various things are not related by closeness, um, and it's not a causal relationship. It's not a matter of cause and effect. So basically, they're saying there's one big event presenting itself. Well, there's another saying in the Bible which I have from your book, mm -hmm. which goes like, "I am the I am, the uh, the amness, the isness. I create light, darkness, peace, and evil." Yes. It's a beautiful and statement. Somehow, yes, and it somehow struck me. Um, yes. At, at a much, the, of course, I knew that, but somehow reading that again, it just struck me. And yes. sitting these days in front of the television, watching the news, and getting all these horrific pictures, um, and hold everything in this. Oneness. Yes. Yeah. All of the apparent terrible things, this mm -hmm. is also the presence of whatever this is, or the happening, you know, whatever this is, this is the way it expresses itself. Yeah. There is never any moment that there is any incorrect expression. It is all this great indefinable presence or indefinable happening. Whatever you're drawn to, however you're drawn to label it is fine. I'm not, I'm not really interested in labeling it. Sometimes I call it Fred. But I'm not really particularly <laughs> concerned about, you know, what you name it as. Um, there's just this event. There's never been any incorrect movement in that event. It's very interesting that we walk around. We don't think that the snowflakes are doing it wrong. We don't think the trees are doing it wrong. We don't think a squirrel is making a mistake in its career as a squirrel. Most of us have the impression that absolutely everything that we see is an expression of the laws of nature. Everything except us which I find very curious, because where would we be existing if we're not part of the event and also an expression of nature? Everything that we apparently are, the body, the, the brain, the particular needs that we are, the particular concerns that we are, the particular aptitudes that we are, the particular abilities that we are, the particular lack of abilities that we are, all of that is an expression of nature. It's simply the one big event expressing itself. So, when you teach that, how do people react? How, do, how can they... Uh, what does that mean? For, for somebody who has bills to pay and screaming children or whatever, yes. what does that mean? There's and no they are looking for happiness, they are looking for freedom, yes. for a way out of everything. Yes. It basically means that the freedom was always there, um, this is the wild, totally free expression of existence. It always has been. So there is no my freedom. There no. is just freedom yes. of creation, of existence. Yes, and in my particular expression, we can even drop the word freedom. There's just this happening, doing what it does. That's all there ever has been. There's no way of saying what it is in any way whatsoever. There's no problem if you have bills to pay and children to raise because that's the divine expression. If you have a, a real interest in that, that interest doesn't come from your creation. It's not you creating that. That is the, the divine expression. Initially, people have the sense that maybe this is taking something away from them, that if they actually believe this from their own experience, that somehow it will all spiral downwards into an incredibly negative event. But it's never been our doing. It's always expressed itself in an up and down. Courage, fear, anxiety, or well, confidence, anxiety, joy, sorrow, confu uh, clarity, and confusion. It's always expressing itself in that way. It's always this indefinable happening. It's not joy, because it sometimes looks like sorrow. It's not clarity, because it sometimes looks like confusion. It's not confidence because it sometimes looks like anxiety and it's just rolling on the way it rolls on. Yes, but it's our mind which separates us from these happenings. You know, if, if I am in the flow and I, ex I had experiences being, s being completely in the flow, not looking at the flow, but being the flow, yes. then sadness and anxiety, whatever arises, there is not a me who reflects on that. 
But in the moment I'm in my mind, yeah. I have fear, I have nothing to eat, I have all that. And that is the suffering. There is what we call apparent suffering, but ultimately there's no way of saying what that is. I'm not saying this happening yeah. that we call suffering doesn't exist. What I'm saying is the happening can't be defined in any way whatsoever. So this happening that we call suffering is not actually something called suffering. There's no way of knowing what it is. There's no way of, of saying anything about it at all. It simply presents itself the way it presents itself. It's not, you know, from my perspective, from this sensibility, it's not that I'm focusing on the mind. There seems to be this apparent focus on form and the belief that the form is the reality and that the label that seems to be attached to the form is actually telling us what that is. Mm -hmm. Really, if we examine our experience, it's very simple, a very simple thing to see that it's a meaningless sound attached to a form that doesn't actually exist. So basically what happens is people hear this, they, they don't want to believe it, but I never point to my experience, I'm pointing to your experience. And I'm simply asking, are you willing to acknowledge your experience? I would like to know your experience. <laughs> so what are your experience? How do you experience reality? Well... <laughs> First of all, I will not describe my particular experience very exactly because it's a unique experience. No one else can have my sensibility. Mm -hmm. Each and every one of us, like, again, within nature, you can't find any two snowflakes the same. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how many snowflakes there seem to be? No, I understand. I'm just curious. Well, I, <laughs> yes. And I won't present it in any great detail because it's of absolutely no benefit to anyone else. I will, however, I can say... Or, or let me say this, in this moment there's no Daryl, there's no Renata, there's no studio, there's no floor, there's no table, there are no glasses, there are no flowers, there's no, no container for the flowers. I can say with absolute certainty that none of these things are, um, but that doesn't mean I'm experiencing anything different from what you're experiencing. No, but are you happy? Am I happy? Life. Sometimes I, I'm apparently happy, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I'm apparently unhappy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever this is does what it does. I have no influence over it ultimately. Yeah. It, will, it will display me in whatever way it displays me, apparently. Do you feel um, you are now more human? No, or more in life? More, more connected with life, in, with everything? No, there is, no? there is just, there's nobody to be connected with the happening, there's just the happening. Right, okay. There, there never was anything but the happening. So, so what does it, you know, I feel I'm, I'm a human being sitting here and I see these flowers, I see you, and I feel happy. Yes. Yeah? It, yes. It's like, so what's the difference? Um. <laughs> So, but okay, what, okay. what does my ex what is it what what makes my experience my personal experience? There is no personal experience. There is just a totally indefinable event. A fantastic story makes all of this your personal experience. The story mm. is a mirage. The mm. form is a mirage. The storyline is a total fantasy. Let me say, I'm simply presenting this for your consideration. I have yeah. no interest in whether anybody else relates or relates to this apparent perspective. This is my expression. I don't even know why I'm actually here in this studio because I don't know why anybody wants to listen to this. <laughs> I think it's fascinating and it's very important what you say. The bottom line is for this apparent form, it just seems like there is a happening. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no way to say what the happening is. There is what we would what used to be called vibration, pulsation, light, sound, all of that. There is apparent form, but there's no sense of what that is. So, you know... I can understand that. You know, I can... If I really look, sitting here, yes. I haven't a clue yes. sometimes. Who is, who is that? 
Yes. What, what is actually sitting here? Yes. And there is no name for it. I know, I know these places yes. too, and sometimes it's different. Yes. But um, I, see, I, I, I agree, there is really no name for it. Mm -hmm. It's just a mystery. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just this, doing what it does. Mm -hmm. And somehow it's now expressing itself in a way that even in the most difficult times, it's always a totally mysterious event, simply mm -hmm. doing what it does. Mm -hmm. Whatever it seems to be presenting in a particular moment, it will al also present whatever apparent response that I am to that. It's always simply an undivided event expressing itself. And, you know, the, the apparent difficulties, there's no way of saying what that is. Even the labels that come and go, that's a totally inexplicable happening doing what it does. There's no, there is now no interest in what it is. It's just happening. And in that, you know, that moves and shifts as it moves and shifts. There are moments of incredible bliss. There are moments when it's just, it seems like nothing much uh, in particular. It's just very quiet and ordinary. And do you find that sometimes your mind still interferes and tells you stories and... and uh no, the stories come and go now. They are a totally indefinable event. When they are apparently needed in a particular situation, mm -hmm. they push themselves forward, they come out. So for instance, there's this happening. Now this is happening. I don't know what this is. This is the only thing that can happen in this moment. It's just happening. It's just an automatic response or an automatic portion of the happening. So I think Somebody once said, it's like, you throw out a question and the response bounces back just in the same way that it, you throw a ball at a wall, yeah, a yeah. rubber ball, and it bounces back. Mm -hmm. It's all on automatic. Um, this, this is nothing more than like a dog barking or a cat meowing or a bird twittering. It's just what happens. It's just what this is expressed as. Well, there's one statement in your book, book also which says, what we think is happening is not actually happening. Exactly. Yeah. This is happening. Yeah. Just what we call this moment or this event. This is happening. All the thoughts we have about it, all the descriptions, the notion of form, mm -hmm. that's not happening. That description is not the reality. Um, the event that we call thought and description, that's happening, but that's also a totally indefinable event simply happening on its own. Mm. I know you spent about six years in a Thai monastery. How was that? What did you, yeah, what did you do there? Um, basically, I did what I would do in the world. We scrubbed floors, we washed dishes um, in certain portions of our training. Um, we repaired buildings, we um, met with guests and uh, assigned them to rooms, and we were good hosts. And, <laughs> and then. <laughs> Was there anything spiritual also happening there? <laughs> <laughs> what we call spiritual, like meditation or whatever? Yes. In the early morning, we would sit for an hour. So at five o'clock in the morning, we would sit mm. in meditation. That's basically why I was there. Or it seems that's why I was there, because it's always been the meditation that was intriguing to me. This was always portrayed as a way of uh, open exploration of the moment. And so within all of the religious traditions that I knew of, the, the basic Buddhist uh, teaching of mm -hmm. meditation to me was the most fundamental approach to the moment, the happening of the moment. Yeah. And it was also very much in alignment with what I had read in Krishnamurti. I began re reading Jiddu Krishnamurti when I was 14. I didn't understand very much of what he was saying. The one thing that really stood out was he said, if you want to learn about life, watch it flow. Uh -huh. he, he was always pointing out that it was changing. He said, if you want to learn about it, watch it flow. So I started watching it flow. What I didn't realize was that at a certain apparent point, it would become obvious that even the observer was flowing. All there was was flowing. It was to a totally unformed happening presenting itself. So who was observing the observer flowing? <laughs> there is, these are, we're trained to bark these words. You know, we have this happening. Yes. It's an undivided event. 
And then we're trained, somebody points at one portion of it and says, and says, now say, that's an object of awareness. And somebody points at another portion of it and says, now call that awareness. These are meaningless sounds. There's just one happening that can't be explained in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The moment the focus goes on these strange, meaningless sounds, awareness, object of awareness, now we're in a total fantasy. There is just this happening. There's no explanation for it. It has no particular form. And that's your experience. You see, all of your life, you've, you've experienced that everything changes. At this point in your life, you know that everything changes. That must mean this is a totally formless event. How would you ever describe a totally formless event? It has no form to describe. Whatever seems to be appearing is automatically on its way to something else. And also, if we examine what we've received in these sounds, these labels, we discover that it's a totally meaningless sound that only takes on meaning when it's connected to an apparent form, but the form isn't a reality. So we have meaningless sound attached to a form that isn't the actual reality. End of story. But we, we I mean, we have a word for all that. We say that's evolution. Maturation and evolution is a constant movement towards something to fulfill itself, I guess. Yes. Whatever that that is, or that that yes. it is, I yes. don't know. It tries to fulfill itself, and you know, goes to all these different forms and and manifestations. So we call that, in our world, evolution, and that's something you can observe. Well, my question is simply this: Why do we put the focus on this meaningless sound instead of resting as the event? I guess so we can communicate with <laughs> each other, <laughs> or I, I don't know, yeah. Within this, you see, ultimately... You know, I'm, I, I think it's great that we have, otherwise, how could you express that? How could you give us the message? I'm not doing anything. If you anything. wouldn't have these words, <laughs> or if true nature or the flow behind yes. you... The thing is, though... ...doesn't have these sounds. The thing is, in this situation, in, th in this expression, I'm not somebody sitting here giving anybody a message. No. There is only a totally inexplicable event doing yeah. what it does. Yeah. All of those fantasies, they are of no interest to me now. Mm -hmm. um, or they are of no interest to this event now. There is just the event. And the event contains what was once called thought. Um, these apparent words, these apparent labels, they still apparently come and go. But they themselves are a totally inexplicable happening, simply happening. Yeah. And so the focus somehow has fallen away from the label and just open to the event. Because right now, you know, in this apparent conversation, the focus is going on the labels. They are this much of what this is. Yeah. They are simply this much yes. of the expression of this. Well, this just scratched the surface. Exactly. There's, yeah. there's simply one minute little expression, yeah. and there, there is now no interest in the minute portion. Mm. There's an overriding interest in the larger event, and that there can be no expression f or no explanation for. The, the labels themselves become or are what they always have been, a totally inexplicable happening, just doing what they do. So within this, I simply point to our, our common experience yeah. and ask people, what does that actually reveal about existence? You know, usually when I sit with somebody and we begin to discuss this, they find themselves agreeing with everything that I point to. So ultimately the question becomes, are you willing to acknowledge what your experience actually is? Because if you are willing to acknowledge it, you are not left with form. You are left with what this is, but somehow a fundamental sense that it ultimately has no form. This is the formless. This is the formless event. Uh, there's no way of saying what it is. And that also the labels that we have ultimately have no meaning whatsoever. We're always searching for an answer. The only reason we're searching for an answer is that we believe there is an answer. We believe there is some description of existence that's somehow true. The moment it's realized that there is no way to describe what's happening right now in any way whatsoever, all questions about existence have to come to an end. 
because no answer is possible to the question. The questions are meaningless. There is no answer that's possible. We all know that. We all know that this is a totally formless, inexplicable happening, and the so-called labels are meaningless sounds pointing to forms that don't actually exist. Well, it was a challenge for me after reading your books. I, saw, I thought, oh my God, I completely agree. <laughs> what am I going to ask him? <laughs> but you are a very good speaker, so <laughs> it's not too bad. So there is actually then also no spiritual path. No. No spiritual path. No one has ever been lost. No one is finding anything. There is always only a totally indefinable event presenting itself the way it presents itself. And we're a portion of the expression. We do not exist as anything apart from this happening. Okay. So, but it took you, I don't know, 10 years or 15 years to find it out? Seems that way. <laughs> <laughs> it took me 20 years to find it out or even longer. Yeah. So there seems to be a kind of a maturation or evolution of I don't know. Now we're going back into the story. <laughs> and all I can respond to... Yeah, but, but, you know, you have to... What I want to say is, you have to be at a certain place, or existence has to be at a certain place yes. to realize that. Existence yeah. does not express everyone in this way. Right. So, there is, in a way, on a different level, a time you go through where through nature, whatever tries to remember itself or uh, I don't know how you would call that mm -hmm. from your perspective. There is an apparent journey. Yeah. But that's a fantasy. However, the apparent journey still presents itself. And so, yes, there was yeah. an apparent journey. Yeah. I no longer have, there is no longer any belief in that storyline. But still, the apparent journey is described. It's part of this occurrence. Yes. Do we have any? <laughs> and yes, within that, within that, it seemed to be a particular individual yeah. coming to certain realizations. At mm -hmm. one point, it seemed like somebody doing something mm -hmm. to ha come to certain realizations. And it seemed like there were cer certain specific points where somehow there was a waking up to a basic fact about life yeah. and in that waking up there was a falling away of certain confusions yeah. and certain emotional concerns around that mm -hmm. but at this you know in this moment this and then through you the gift comes it seems to to express itself or, or point yes yes that's quite miraculous because yeah. You know, there, is, there are these happenings, like for instance, I've been in London for the last weekend and we had some gatherings and mm -hmm. apparently I'm sitting in a room with a bunch of people and yeah. apparently I'm saying something and... Yeah. And, and it's words. It's, it's you say words. It's, a, it's apparently <laughs> words. I don't know what it is. <laughs> to me, or in this situation, like it's just a, an event that presents itself. Yeah. Yes, it's what we normally apparently call words. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what it is. It presents itself. But then the, these words carry the depths of your experience. And that's why what you told me earlier, I think people realized it with one a second, another person started crying. Yes. So there is something coming through these words. It's interesting the way you put it. Yeah. You say that my words express the depth of my experience. But to me, that's not what's happening. The words are pointing to the depth of your experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I often, you know, there are these apparent situations where there are other apparent teachers expressing this, and often they keep the focus on their own experience. I'm not interested in my experience. I'm pointing to your experience, and that's where the power is. I'm yeah. pointing out that you already know the formless. It, you complain about it all the time. My body isn't what it used to be, it's growing older. The weather isn't what it used to be, it's all confused. It used to be really wonderful summers, now they're all broken up with rain and cold. The government isn't what it used to be. My health isn't what it used to be. We complain about the movement of existence. Yeah, you're right. We I just realize we do that, but which are without realizing what we are actually saying. 
we're complaining about God's expression. We're complaining yeah. about the dance of the formless. Mm -hmm. And exactly what you said, there's no realization of that. There's a complaint about that. We always want it to express itself one way, but it's formless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't express itself one apparent way. Whatever it seems to be in this moment is always moving on to another appearance. And then we complain because we want it to be, we want it to have form. We want it to be only the golden, glowing, clear, confident expression and never the dark, confused, frightened moment. Mm. But all of it is the gift. All of it is the divine expression. How can we come to this point? Are you willing to acknowledge what your actual experience is? You've already told me you agree totally that this is a totally formless event. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm more thinking about our viewers now, you know, to sit in front of this program and think, okay, where do I start now? What am I going, how do I live my life now? It, do you have any advice for them <laughs> or for us? If, do you mean if they realize this yeah. truth? Yeah, if they fact. realize, yes, that sounds right, was okay. barely saying. I will say, I will make one statement about what you can do, and it's the only thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. In this moment, the only thing that you can ever do is be the expression that nature is presenting in this moment. It's never been you influencing it in any way. You are the expression of nature or the universe, um, the unformed ocean of existence, God, whatever you want to call it. The only thing you can ever do is be the expression that you are in this moment. And whatever that seems to be is automatically moving on to whatever it will present as next. In this apparent journey, there was no you doing the journey. It has always been the expression of this inexplicable happening. You haven't brought yourself to this truth. You are being expressed in this way. This apparent me is expressed in this way. It's simply happening. Now it seems that the, uh, the happening of existence may be expressing certain apparent individuals as waking up to the unformed ocean of existence, but that's not actually what's happening. It's just a totally unformed, inexplicable happening doing what it does. It's not a situation of people waking up. It's this inexplicable happening doing what it does. It seems like a bunch of people waking up, but it's not. And whatever, you know, this apparent occurrence of people waking up is the movement of the inexplicable. It's never been anything other than the formless dance and it will move in whatever way it will move. We have no option in that. Mm. I don't know, like, I could leave this studio, trip on the stairs, fall down and die. It could express this, what I am, in that way. I could go home to Canada and my whole apparent happening could be expressed as an extreme biochemical imbalance and it would move into total depression. I have no say in that. It will do whatever it will do. Thus far, it seems to be moments of joy and moments of difficulty. Um, it will, you know, it, it always seems to have this wave action of some kind, so no matter what happens, it will have some kind of wave action to it. Um, I'm not concerned because it will just happen the way it happens. Just listening to you, now, yes. to your last statement, there is a feeling of gratefulness and appreciation arising that I'm sitting here mm -hmm. with you, still sitting here. Yes. <laughs> you never know what happens the next moment. Exactly. Yeah. You never know what's coming. All of it is the natural expression of what this is. But we begin to really be grateful yeah. for, the, apparently, we begin to be grateful mm -hmm. for um, those moments that we do label wonderful. Yeah. Um, the kind of blissful moments, the soft, gentle moments, um, acknowledging that maybe at some other point, or it will at some other point, presenting, be presenting apparent moments of difficulty, moments of darkness. All of it is the divine expression, or we might say all of it is the gift. You know, if someone went to Ramana Maharshi and asked him, you know, what do I do? He would say, be what you are. 
And in a way, I'm saying that same thing, but it's in a slightly different version. I'm saying the only thing you can ever do is be what you're being presented as now, you're, yeah. is be the ex whatever expression nature is giving rise to in this moment. Well, that's a great ending, Daryl. I'm sorry we have to end now. <laughs> yeah, it's been very Enjoyed. enjoyable speaking with you. It's <laughs> yes, and you. Um, are you going back to Canada? No? I will. I have a few days visiting with friends. This yeah. is the last... Um, um, Satsang with yeah. me, <laughs> with our audience. Yes, it's the yeah. last happening yeah. related to this apparent non-dual statement. Yeah. Now I go to the country to spend time with friends and then I fly back on the 6th of September mm. and I'll go back to work in a warehouse, yeah. which I enjoy very much. You know, I liked it. <laughs> You're so completely ordinary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes, it's, and yet it's always the wild, exotic dance mm, of existence. Mm. You never know where you end up. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that totally. So. Okay, well, thank you for being with us, Daryl, and uh, thank you for watching Conscious TV. Goodbye. <laughs>